Good evening. This is Ronald Coleman inviting you to join Mrs. Coleman and me for the next half hour when our sponsors, the brewers of Schlitz Beer, present the Halls of Ivy. If you like good beer, do as millions of people are doing all over the country. Ask for Schlitz, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. Schlitz tastes so good to so many people that it's the largest selling beer in America. It has to be fine to be first. And now, the Halls of Ivy. Welcome again to Ivy, Ivy College, that is, in the town of Ivy, USA. The hounds of spring are yapping merrily at Ivy's president, Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall. Their happy barking announces that summer, as Chaucer so quaintly put it, is coming in, and that the academic year is a going out. Relishing the idea, Dr. Hall sits in the afternoon sun, perusing that handbook of the male species, a sporting goods catalog. <laughs> Ah, uh, Vicky, it's really amazing. Toddy, I'm so glad to hear you say so. You are? Why? Oh, well, I find it refreshing to think that a man of your knowledge and experience can still find things to be amazed at. Shows an open mind. Oh, thank you. I'm not one who believes that an open mind is an equivalent to a hole in the head. <laughs> hmm. Equivalent to a hole in the head. Uh, is that your own, Vicky? You mean my own head? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Your own observation. Oh, yeah, I think so. If I owe it to Earl Wilson or somebody, I apologize. Uh, what do you find there that's so amazing? Well, the items in this catalogue. It's incredible, the impedimenta which have been evolved to ease the hardships of the summer camper. Mm -hmm. It's getting so that a life in the open is only slightly less rugged than a five-room suite at the Ambassador East. Yeah, well, if you're planning on roughing it this summer in the pump room, Doctor, you've got yourself a fellow camper. Uh, if I may refer to myself as a fellow. <laughs> Look at some of these things. <laughs> Flashlights which need no batteries. Butane cook stoves. Mm. Portable refrigerators. Foam rubber mattresses in weatherproof tents. Mosquito repellent. Oh, that's for me. No mosquito has yet been repelled by me. <laughs> ah, isn't it nice to know that you are irresistible even to a mosquito? Well, yes, yes. But uh, it's the only example of it I've ever experienced where I had to slap my own face. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, look, look at all this. I wonder what Daniel Boone and Kit Carson would have thought of these little aids to life in the open. Oh, they'd have sneered at them. You can't shoot a buffalo for lunch with a spray gun full of citronella. No, no, if only one could, one... Now, get that calculating look out of your eye, William. You can't el eliminate the Wellmans of the world either with a spray gun. Now, how did you know I was thinking of Mr. Wellman? Well, whenever you think of him, your hands make little strangling gestures. <laughs> what brought him to mind, talking about mosquitoes? No. No, I, I'm expecting him any minute. He called a while ago. Trouble? Uh, now, darling, did he ever come here bringing me violets? <laughs> ah, well, what's bothering our little splinter from the Board of Governors? Uh, well, it's a, it's a student named Richard Alden. He'd be eligible for the Noblingdale Award if he were to graduate, but we can't graduate him. Why not? I thought Richard Alden was Phi Beta Kappa and an all-round mental whiz-bang. Well, he is, in science. But he seems to think that the rest of our curriculum was designed to hamper him in his favorite subject. I would be derelict in my duty to graduate such a brilliant ignoramus. His arrogant attitude toward a well-rounded yeah. education Enter is... Enter Splinter. Stage oh. left. Oh, yes. Now, let's make time count. And let's not dawdle with amenities, Mrs. Hall and Dr. Hall. This is Richard Alden. Well, hello. Yeah. hello, Richard. And don't bother wasting time on the lows because I'm not blaming you, Dr. Hall, even though it is your fault. What do you have to say in the face of such evidence? Uh, who, me? I'm a very plain and simple-minded man, Dr. Hall. Get down to brass cases. I mean, hard tax. Rice tax, Dr. Hall. <laughs> well, it's precisely where we are now. 
And it was an unfortunate oversight that you were the last one to know. But you seem so preoccupied with other matters... Well, you've that... taken the words right out of my mouth, which is exactly why I'm here. Who, may I ask, has been most interested in the advancement of this institution? Who has tried to make its name a byword in every home in America? Who? 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 You have us there, Mr. Wellman. I have. That's whom? Who? And at last, we have, have a student, Richard Alden, here, who finally wins the Noblingdale Award, and what do you do? Yes, Toddy, well, answer the man. What do you do? Well, it seems to me, Mr. Wellman, that the terms of the award leave it open only to students who are graduating. A man like this boy, Richard Alden, brilliant. Science and test tubes and equations only an Einstein could understand. Thank you, Mr. Wellman. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, no one who... I, I mean, if anyone else was or... Now, what was the point I was making? <laughs> well, I believe you were about to say that such a man or boy it must certainly, most certainly should be graduating. Uh, but uh, I, I think perhaps this is a matter for Richard and me to discuss in private. What? I pick up the cudgel in his behalf. I gird my armor. I... Lower the boom. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been so... So outraged. Oh, I'm sure you have, Mr. Wellman. <laughs> yes. True. I have. I wash my hands. Clean. As a whistle. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hall. He makes me nervous. <laughs> oh, you, you have to understand, Mr. Wellman. He can get along with anybody except people. <laughs> Will you have some uh, tea or coffee, Richard? Nothing, thank you. Oh. Dr. Hall, my grades are the highest of any student in this college since 1896. I have surpassed all other Phi Beta Kappas in this college. And furthermore, no Ivy student has ever won the Noblingdale Award. Yes, you're quite right, Richard. However, let us go from the realm of higher intellectual pursuit to some simple arithmetic. You have chosen the field of averages, so I advance them. One hundred and zero averages what? Fifty, of course. And that is your grade average. And that is why you're failing. I am a science major, Dr. Hall. I see no reason for attending classes in the history of the novel or Greek and Roman drama. A Greek and Roman drama can be quite exciting. You know, I once played Clytemnestra. Who? Uh, a woman famous in Greek classical tragedy, but you'll probably remember her better as a contemporary of Pythagoras' triangle. I'm a scientist. Or would be if you'd let me graduate. Oh, I, I'm not stopping you, Richard. The curriculum is... Well, why do you so vehemently object to the arts and letters, Richard? What do they lead to? What is the functional value of a sonnet? Well, my dear boy, because a sonnet cannot be reduced to a mathematical formula, and I'm not sure that it can't, <clears throat> but just because it is a thing which stimulates the imagination and evokes pleasure, it doesn't mean that it has no functional value. Yes, but what uh, I mean excuse is... Excuse me. Uh, you, you might ask me the functional value of a violin obbligato, the remembered fragrance of a mountain morning, the ripple of a trout stream. And I'd say that the function, functional value of anything is its special purpose, its reason for being. The reason for being of all these things of the soul and the emotions is simply that they are a spiritual bank account on which human beings may draw at will. And as a too restricted specialist, Richard, you are well on your way to becoming an emotional pauper, spiritually bankrupt. I don't like to seem obtuse, Doctor, but I still don't see how I need trout streams and mountain mornings and sonnets. Logically, where would all the philosophers and writers and artists be without engineers, without bridges? You're terribly wet, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> well, logic, logic like functionalism, can also be twisted to strange uses. I'm reminded of the centipede who refused to go under the viaduct because the clearance was limited to 13 feet. <laughs> uh, Richard. Richard, you're a boy who's determined to go places, right? Yes, sir, I think so. Going far. Snapped up by some big concern or firm for your valuable scientific mind. In charge of research. Uh -huh. Invent things, improve them, perfect them. Invent things just like that? Or invent things for other things. For people. Ah, yes, yes, people. You hadn't mentioned them. I wasn't sure. They're the ones who buy the products, aren't they? I wasn't sure how you classified people as customers or as mankind. 
I think I know mankind as well as the next fellow. Ah, now we're getting into semantics again. The next fellow, Richard, is a mythical being utilized for purposes of reference by those seeking support for unworthy arguments. His credit standing is nil, and his social security number is 0-0. Zero zero. Now, you, as a practicing scientist, shouldn't call upon such an inexact figure as the next fellow. You're just sparring with me, Dr. Hall. Mm -hmm. What does all this have to do with my graduation and getting on with my scientific work? Well, I think, Richard, that Dr. Hall is trying to point out that he doesn't approve of half-educated graduates. Did you ever read history for fun, Richard? No, sir. I never considered it fun. Are you familiar with Moby Dick? Certainly. As a boy... It's a very exciting adventure story for teenage boys. Oh, good heavens, no, if, if I may venture an opinion. Ah, it's, it's for rulers and saints, soldiers and philosophers, poets and leaders. Uh, the good soul, Ahab, turned into a dangerous man by his pursuit of the demon whale, because he has no goal but to kill the huge thing. Ahab, stung by his own vanity flinging himself against the lashing winds and crashing tides of sea that... Ahoy there, Captain Hall. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, anyway, uh, uh, as for the human being, few things tell us quite as much as a Melville or a Tolstoyan paragraph, a Jonathan Swift epigram. Well, I'll take pi equals three and fourteen hundredths. And assuming you do succeed in squaring the circle, Richard... Who will be there to applaud your wondrous feet? Beth, for one. Beth Lansing, my wife. You oh. see, Toddy, he has have got other interests. Oh, I'm overwhelmed and delighted. Is your wife a scientist too, Richard? Not exactly. Not exactly a uh, scientist? Well, I'm sure, sure I didn't mean not exactly a wife. <laughs> yes, I did, Mrs. Hall. Oops, sorry. <laughs> We're engaged. She's a senior too. We were going to be married when I graduated. If I graduate. If it's possible to let a straight-A science student get a diploma at this college. Oh, several of them have received diplomas. But they weren't so insistent about altering the entire course of study at Ivy. I don't care about the course of study. I'm speaking of me. Let anyone else do what he likes, but so far as I'm concerned, an hour's study on anything else is one hour less I can devote to science. Goodbye, Mrs. Hall. Dr. Hall. Is he really as bright a science student as he says he is? Oh, he most certainly is. Hmm. But <laughs> if I were a little younger and a little stronger, I might throw him to the floor and sit on his chest while I reread the classics aloud to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of his chest, I have a notion. And the best way to a man's heart... is through his stomach, according to the old adage... An adage which I reject as being medically impractical, aesthetically distasteful, and conversationally repulsive. <laughs> then how about the way to a man's heart is through his heart? Simple ah. approach. Uh, why mm -hmm. play an organ recital? My very point. Then I take it you're referring in your oblique feminine way to Beth Lansing, who I'm sure sees no faults in our unromantic young friend. Oh, sure. The only time a woman ever understands her husband is before she marries him. Uh, incidentally... Yes? Why did you ask Richard if he'd read history for fun? Uh, well, I mean, aside from finding out if he'd had any other interests. Because, like so many impetuous people, he has no understanding whatsoever of the pertinence of accumulated knowledge in fields other than his own. He's never understood that wise men have recorded their yesterdays to help fools meet their tomorrows. Why didn't you tell him that before he left? <laughs> because that is what I call one of my taxicab rejoinders. What on earth is a taxicab rejoinder? That, my darling, is the devastating retort you could have used to such good effect at the party, but don't think of until you're on your way home. <laughs> What about Beth Lansing? When you think of beer, think of this. Schlitz tastes so good to so many people, it's the largest selling beer in America. <laughs> 
Back in 1849, a little brewery in the village of Milwaukee produced the first barrel of Schlitz beer. Before that time, people didn't pay much heed to the name of the brewer. Beer was beer, and that's all anyone cared to know. In the years between, however, people began to notice that certain brands of beer had more to offer than others. As the brewer's brand increased in importance, both Schlitz and Milwaukee became known throughout the world. Milwaukee as the home of premium beer. Schlitz as the beer that made Milwaukee famous. Today, this outstanding Milwaukee-born beer has an even more special distinction. Schlitz, the beer that made Milwaukee famous, tastes so good to so many people that it's first in sales in America. The taste that built that popularity is yours in every glass of Schlitz beer. Enjoy it, for chances are you'll like Schlitz best, too. <laughs> join the halls of Ivy, we find Dr. Hall, who's been working on the project of adding a spur line of human emotion to the single-track mind of Richard Alden, just entering the house. Uh, Vicky, In here. Come on in, darling. Yeah, now, darling, this is Beth Lansing. Beth, Dr. Hall. Hello, Dr. Hall. Oh, I'm delighted to see you. I'm very curious to know how Richard's getting along. Yeah, but that's what Beth called me about. Well, he isn't getting along very well. He seems to be muttering things about you, Toddy. Oh, not really muttering, shouting. He shouts now, and he never used to. Well, that's why I had to talk to you, Mrs. Hall. But why didn't you talk to me, Beth? Oh, it was the roundabout approach, I guess. I was being feminine and clever by taking it up with Mrs. Hall. Anyhow, how could I talk to you about how Richard dislikes you? Well, <laughs> well naturally, I prefer to be liked rather than disliked. But I've found that an antagonism here or there is not necessarily lethal. Any person with character is bound to find a few opponents. But as long as his adversaries are outnumbered by his allies, this is mere stimulation. Yeah, well, speaking of, uh, as one of Dr. Hall's allies, Beth, just how does Richard feel? He feels like, well, that you're keeping him from his ultimate fulfillment, Dr. Hall. Those were his very words. Mm. They sound like his very words, the dear young pinhead. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not the founder of Ivy College, Beth. The required study has been in effect for several years. Richard should realize that. Yeah, if we'd known he was coming, we'd have baked a curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. He can't see that. He can't see anything. He just says it's all your fault and doesn't know why. Mm. Well, a more articulate man once had a similar feeling about the head of another college. He said, I do not love thee, Dr. Fell. The reason why, I cannot tell. But this alone I know full well. I do not love thee, Dr. Fell. <laughs> but that's just how he feels. For a fellow with a scientific mind, I keep telling him he isn't being very scientific. Accusing you of purposely holding him back without having any proof. But if he looked for proof, he'd come face to face with himself somewhere along the route. Well, a man who has proposed marriage has faced himself, and several other people too. Proposed marriage? Richard never proposed marriage. Oh. oh. Perhaps he sent it to you written up as some sort of equation. <laughs> <laughs> Mass equals religious ceremony. <laughs> religious ceremony divided by two equals marriage. And if bride can make pie or 3.1416, so much the better. <laughs> oh, no. Our engagement was just understood. By both of you? Well, kind of. Well, he keeps talking about our plans for the future. Well, he's never said he loves me. Well, outright. But he's quite emphatic about the future. Is that fun? I mean, uh... <laughs> I'd hate to have my hand held by a man who just wanted to read my palm. Well, no, it isn't much fun, really. Well, not as much as it should be. Oh, but sometimes... Well, as long as you're happy with it that way. <laughs> well, I have to make allowances for the fact that Richard isn't very demonstrative. No. 
No, to demonstrate anything, Richard seems to need a blackboard. <laughs> if I'm not too personal, what allowances does a woman in love make for her fiancé's inability to express his affection? Well, actually... Well, actually, I don't know. Sometimes I think he's just shy. Other times I think he's egotistic. And other times... Well, I don't know what I think. What would you like him to be? Well, relaxed. <laughs> I'd like him to be the kind of man who walks in the park and talks to strangers. I'd like him to waste time at least once in a while. I'd like to hear him talk about... about spring. Well, yes, just about spring. But well, perhaps he can't. I mean, spring isn't scientific. It's emotional. Oh, that's silly. He could talk about it if he wanted to. The talks have to start sometime. And right now is fine. You know, I don't think Richard has been very nice to me at all. <laughs> Excuse me, I... I mean, I... Well, goodbye. I, uh, I have a feeling that the scientific Mr. Alden is about due for a rude jolt in his trigonometry. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to have to make at least a temporary choice between Cupid and Pythagoras. Or, to put it bluntly, if he is as bright as I think, he'll swap his Euclid for a uke. Dr. Hall speaking. Dr. Hall, this is Wellman. Clarence Wellman! <laughs> well, how are you, Mr. Wellman? My patience knows no bounds, Doctor. But you have strayed into a, I mean, a disaster about to befall. Oh, I hardly feel the situation merits the gravity you bring to it. Really? Maybe you can afford to sit there and be calm, which is what you'll pay for. But it isn't every year the Noblingdale Science Award is offered to an Ivy student, and we may lose it because of sheer, yes, unadulterated stubbornness. I can't force Richard Alden to study certain subjects. Blaming the boy won't do any good. And it may interest you to know, I am going to suggest to the Board of Governors that they completely alter the student program. There'll be no repetition of this event. Well, you, you mean alter the curriculum to suit one petulant student? Oh, I feel we can work out some sort of compromise on this. Now, see here, I'm not inter interested in a compromise. I want a solution. Enough shilly-shally. I mean, beating about the... Did you say compromise? <laughs> yes. Instead of destroying the university by altering the entire pattern of our educational process to conform to Richard Alden's needs... The point, the point, the point! Well, we, 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 we will simply take the two or three professors who block our path and burn them. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is, if you, if you really think this boy is more important than education itself. Dr. Hall, one more chance, 24 hours... That's all, and then I go to the Board of Governors. And a word to the wise in time saves... Yes! <laughs> well, Miss, Mr. Wellman, if I can possibly think of anything else, I'll call you immediately. Meanwhile, be of good cheer and say hello to the wife and children. Goodbye. <laughs> take much of your time, Dr. Hall. I'm leaving school. For another university? No, I'm through with all of them. Well, there's some awfully nice universities around. Right now, I just want to know why you turned Beth against me. She argued with everything I said. You mean she had some opinions? Of her own? Some? <laughs> Hundreds. I've never heard so many opinions from one person. And very unsound. Well, she did seem like a very unreasonable girl. Uh, the kind who'd make outlandish demands. She probably thought she should go on a world cruise and settle in Capri. Did she tell you that? Well, no. <laughs> but uh, sometimes you can tell by just looking. All she told me were a bunch of sophomoric ideas about... Well, I mean, about personal relationships, emotional attachments. Love? I always thought a woman wanted security. And what's more secure than a husband who has a scientific training? What could be more security to any woman? The husband himself, I should think. 
Well, that's assuming you are a scientist, Richard. You could easily become nothing more than a batch of remembered axioms and mathematical problems which an electronic machine can solve faster and better and which wouldn't flirt with a switchboard girl. That's an awful thing for a college president to say. <laughs> Why, I, I'm simply trying to tell you that, that science as an end in itself is not so amazing. Nature has made the trapdoor spider a great engineer. A bee can construct perfect hexagons in wax. But your, your future associates will be people, not insects. I'm exactly what this college taught me to be. Oh, oh pardon me. You're, you are only what you permitted this college to teach you. What you let yourself be taught. Now, I'm sure you've read Diderot's scientific encyclopedia. Every page of it. In it, the world of the 18th century saw new hope. To bring it out of its trembling despotism. It saw Diderot's scientific examination as long needed. But there were men of dark little notions and limited minds who so viciously opposed Diderot's explanation of facts, they came terribly close to destroying this masterwork. But Diderot won, didn't he? He beat them all. He did. He did, as you so quaintly put it, beat them all. But not until a non-scientific mind came to his rescue, not until Voltaire, who was nothing but a writer and whose only province was people, not until Voltaire wrote so strongly for the right of all men to examine truth as they wish. Not until then. I didn't know that. No. You knew the text, but you didn't know the people. Well, more, more. What happened next? Well, nothing much. Except that, <laughs> except that Voltaire made his point because he believed we were each other's enemy as long as we lived only for ourselves. Don't know people. Maybe I don't. Study them. Study them. They may not be scientific, but they're good collateral reading. Yeah, I uh, guess I'd better shut up until I do. <laughs> and don't forget, uh, it's a wise man and a successful one who knows the precise psychological moment when to say nothing. Uh, Oscar Wilde, Victoria Poets, course 293A. You know something? I've been a knucklehead. That's an expression from upperclassman 51, bull session. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. I appreciate the new slant you've given me. Oh, you're quite welcome, I'm sure. And Richard, while you're broadening your outlook and congratulating yourself on the Noblingdale Award, I'd suggest a rereading of Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland? Yes, by Lewis Carroll, writer of magical nonsense, who was also, I think it is pertinent to remind you, Charles Ludwig Dodgson... A mathematician. He did a great deal of summing up with figures of speech. Yeah, I, uh, I think I see what you mean. Thank you, sir. And, well, thanks. You needn't look so smug, Doctor. It wasn't just you. After all, it's June, and he's young, and he's got a girl. <laughs> <laughs> I know, my darling. The satisfaction which you detected on my face was not so much from any personal triumph as it was an agreeable appreciation of the fact that between you and me and Spring and Beth... And Mr. Wellman. Yes, and even the ubiquitous Clarence. Between us all, we have succeeded in keeping a budding scientist from becoming a blooming idiot. <laughs> When you think of beer, think of this. Schlitz tastes so good to so many people, it's the largest selling beer in America. America today faces two enemies, aggression abroad and inflation at home. With a double job to do, we need to step up our production faster than ever before, produce more goods every hour of every day of every week. In peacetime, our free American economic system has given us an unrivaled standard of living. The defense program will call for sacrifices. But the more we produce, the fewer those sacrifices will be. Remember, the better we produce, the stronger we grow. Here again are Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> See you next week at the same time at the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Mr. Wellman is played by Herbert Butterfield. 
Also in our cast were Gene Bates and Eddie Firestone. Tonight's script was written by Arthur Ross and Don Quinn. The Halls of Ivy was created by Don Quinn, directed by Nat Wolf, and presented by the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who invites you to enjoy the Pulitzer Prize Playhouse on television on Friday nights. Ken Carpenter speaking. Here are the great Gildersleeve and his lovable family on NBC.